We are in Matthew. Did you get one for your dad? Did you get a patron Daniel too? Okay. Thank you guys very much. Did you get one, Daniel? There you go. Got it. Thank you very much. So we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 24 and Matthew chapter 25. We're going to be looking at them together. So if you want to turn to Matthew 24, 25, of course, we'll be jumping around all over the place, probably in the Bible, but this is where we're focusing on. Matthew 24, Matthew 25. Now when we start looking at Matthew chapter 24, well, before we go any farther, does somebody want to read Matthew 24, verse 3, and someone else, Matthew 25, and verse 31? Matthew 24, verse 3, Matthew 25, and 31. And it's at the top of the notes, too. I'll go ahead and read the first one, Matthew 24, verse 3, and verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming? And the end of the end of the world. Would someone else like to read Matthew chapter 25, verse 31? You don't have the top page of it? Okay. Does everybody have both pages of the paper? Back and forth, and I pause a little bit. We'll understand why. The Mount of Olives is 
extremely, extremely important. If it's one thing I love to do in the Bible is connect things. I see how this verse goes with this verse, or how this passage, and you're reading something all along, and it's like, the reference may not be notable if you were doing a keyword search or something like that, but you know what it's referring back to. And you just make these little mental notes. When it comes to the Mount of Olivet, the Mount of Olivet is very, very neat, especially in the passage where we're talking. The fact that they're talking about Mount Olivet, of all places, is absolutely significant. And the reason of that being is, first of all, they're on the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives, we can start talking about the olive trees, how it was using anointing oil, yada, yada, yada. But the Mount of Olivet itself is extremely important. When we talk about the Bible, what do we know about significant things that might concern Mount Olivet? Do we know what? And I know. I'm pulling, I'm pulling, I'm pulling. So let me just do the quick rundown. So, I probably ought to go to my notes for this one. We'll talk about the significance of all of it. They're at the bottom of page one and bleed into page two. First of all, it's east of Jerusalem. From its summit, you can see practically the entire city of Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. It is approximately a mile long and 700 feet high. It is a Sabbath day journey from Jerusalem. Would someone please read Acts chapter 1 and verse 12? Acts 1 12. And while we're there, would somebody be willing to look up Exodus 16 29? Exodus 16 29. So first we'll read Acts 1 12. So the Bible itself, if we are to take the book of Acts as a primary document during this time, they instruct us that the travel time from the Mount of Olives to Jerusalem is a Sabbath day journey. Now, the Sabbath day journey will play into some things we talk about tonight, so it's important to note this. The law of Moses actually forbade travel on the Sabbath. If someone would please read Exodus 16:29. Exodus 16 and verse 29. See, see, for the Lord has given you the Sabbath, therefore he gives you on the sixth day the bread of two days. Abide ye every man in this place, let no man go out of this place on the Sabbath. So he's not supposed to go out of his place on the Sabbath day. However, so when we get into the time of Jesus, there were restrictions on how far you were allowed to travel on the Sabbath day. When we, we'll be talking about a little bit later where uh, talking about the end time, Jesus tells them, pray that the day that you flee is not on the Sabbath for this reason. Because as Jews, they were only permitted to go so far. And according to Barnes' Commentary: The Jews agreed that the distance that one was permitted to travel on the Sabbath was right around 2,000 cubits, seven furlongs, or, in our determined mileage, only about one mile. So, the distance from Mount of Olives to Jerusalem was what the Bible was referred to as a Sabbath day's journey, which is about approximately one mile. And we know... We should know that it was called Olivet because we've already mentioned earlier from the fact that olives were grown there, olive trees. Now, when we look at Mount Olivet, there were two roads to get past Olivet itself. There was a road down along the mountain and a road over top of the mountain. To put it in our geography, it was Peter's Mountain. You either went around it or you went over it. And that was basically the way to get around the Mount, um, to get around the Mount of Olives. It is, and this is interesting as well, because now we find it move into the second important reason on why he was on the Mount of Olives. Do, do you remember where Jesus told them to go?
for the colt and the donkey when he was going to make his triumphal entry through Jerusalem? No, he didn't tell him to do Bethlehem, but it does start with a B. What famous place does Jesus have friends at? He even brought one back from the dead. It's also a woman's name. Bethany. So, when we look at Bethany, Bethany was on the east side of the Mount of Olives. So they traveled to the Mount of, uh, to Bethany, over top or around the base of the Mount of Olives, and most people believe that Jesus actually rode uh, the animals over the top of the mountain, which was the most treacherous. It was the shortest distance, but it was the most treacherous. So the Mount of Olives is important because A is where Jesus gave probably his back last big explanation to his disciples. B, that's where he got the colt that he was gonna and the donkey where he was gonna ride into Jerusalem from. When we talk about the brook Kidron in the Bible, it actually runs between Mount Olivet and Jerusalem. And then we get to the third important thing about the Mount of Olives, and I wish I would put this in our notes, but there was a very important meal. In fact, it was the very last meal. The Bible says they went out, sang a hymn, and then they went out to some place. You want to guess where that place was? The Garden of Gethsemane. But where was the Garden of Gethsemane? And the Mount of Olives. So now we have the Mount of Olives being significant because of one of the last major discourses that Jesus gave or talks that he had with his disciples. It's the home of Bethany. It's the place where Jesus probably rode the donkey from up and over the mountain into Jerusalem. It's where he goes after the Last Supper. It's where he goes to pray, and it's really the place where he determines that this is the place where I have made my stand that I'm going to go to the cross no matter what. For the joy set before me, I'm going to go to the cross. That was determined in Gethsemane, which was on the Mount of Olives. It is here where he is betrayed by his disciple, and if I'm not mistaken, it's probably one of the last miracles that he does before he's crucified, the healing of Malchus's ear. If we go a little bit farther, the Mount of Olives is significant for another reason. If someone would read Acts chapter 1, 11 and 12. Acts 1, 11 and 12. Acts chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. So when Jesus left this world after his resurrection, where does the Bible say that he left in the clouds at? The Mount of Olivet. Now, we're getting into the last and final reason for the significance of Mount Olivet being the center of this discussion. Because, and we'll bring this down here in a second. Like I said, I'm going to be all over my notes. I can feel it. But Zechariah chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and women ravished, and the house, and the house is rifled, and the women ravished, and the half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as he fought in the day of battle. And this is very important on the last, on the fourth verse. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the mount of what? Olives, which is before Jerusalem. On the east, and the mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst, 
they're up toward the okay. shall yeah, toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and the half of the mount shall re be shall be moved toward the north, and a half of it towards the south. Now we're going to pause right here, keep this passage in mind, because what is the reason that we're having this discussion in the first place? Well, the disciples ask three questions that are being answered within this discussion. The first one being, will you tell us of these things when these things shall be, referring to the end of the world. What are the signs of the end of the world's coming? What shall be the sign of thy coming? And what shall be the sign of the end of the world? All that is being discussed in chapters 24 and 25. And when we look at Mount Olivet, we are looking at the significance of it being, this is the last place that Jesus gave his final discussion. What was that discussion on? The end of the world. His second coming. What shall the signs be? It is the place where Jesus led his triumphal entry into Jerusalem when they, did, when they called him Hosanna and called him king with their mouth but didn't declare him king with their hearts. It is the last place where he was when, right before the crucifixion, where he had everything solidified that I'm going to the cross for the church because that is the joy which is set before me. It is there where he is caught up into the clouds. And the angel says, this same Jesus shall come in like manner. What is this angel referring to? What we just read in Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 4. Jesus Christ, instead of ascending, this time he's going to descend from the cloud. His foot, this is the place where his foot, let me back up. This is the last place his foot left the earth. And it's going to be the very first place his foot physically sets down on the earth. And the Bible says when his foot sits down, that there the Mount of Olives will literally split and form the Valley of Jehoshaphat. And we can go into all kinds of end times discussion here and going on to the Battle of Armageddon because that's exactly what's going on as described in Zechariah. Nation against nation shall rise up against him. So that is why the Mount of Ol the Olive Discourse and its location is so important. We're discussing end time events. What's going to be the signs? We get the Mount of Olives is all along going to be the final site where Christ is taken up, and it's going to be the first site where he sets down when it comes to end time events. Now, just throwing it out there, the key verses of Matthew chapter 24 are listed there. The key verses of Matthew chapter 25 and their phrases are listed there. The key phrases of Matthew chapter 24 or of course end of the world son of that coming key phrases that I brought out in 25 are bridegroom coming and son of excuse me son of man shall come when we look at the passage in general it is this, it is broken down into three different um, sections or divided into three different parts Christ's predictions concerning the future the parables the parables like I said, this is not an uncommon passage to most of us. The parables of a saying, you're going to know exactly what they are. The ten wise or the ten virgins, the parable of the talents, the faithful and evil servant. Most commentators will state that there's three parables in here, which there are. There are three main parables in this passage if we break it down into our classification of a parable. And we simplify it by stating uh, earthly story with a heavenly meaning. However, really, I threw in there four parables. Jesus Christ himself said, remember, uh, learn the parable of the fig tree in Matthew chapter 24, 32 through 33. And I do want to bring this out real quickly. Let me jump back to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. 32-33. And the Bible reads, Now learn a parable of the fig tree, when his branch is yet tender, and put it forth leaves, ye know the summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see these things, know that it is near, even at the door. So when we look at this parable, it's not something that we would think of a parable like a heavenly, earthly story with a heavenly meaning, and, oh, I can't grasp this, grasp this. But this parable is extremely, extremely important. 
because of all the parables that Jesus Christ gave us in his entire lifetime, of all the parables that Christ mentioned with the disciples and everything else, recorded, and I'm sure there were probably unrecorded ones as well that we don't have um, right down and documented in the scriptures. There is only one parable that you're going to discover that Christ actually told them to learn. He didn't tell them with the parable of the wise men, uh, of, the, of the virgins to remember this or learn it. He didn't tell them to learn the parable of the evil and wise servant. He didn't tell them to learn the parable of even when you're comparing the soil with the stony ground. This two-verse parable is the only one he told them to learn. And that is the parable of the fig tree. This is extremely important because, especially of the topic at hand, contained within these two chapters. Because we're discussing the end of the world. And he mentions, uh, learn the parable of the fig tree when its branches are yet tender. And I'm just going back to make sure I have everything accurate when I'm saying it. And put it forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. And he says, likewise, when ye shall see these things, know that the that it is near. What is near? The end is near. The come even at your door. The coming of Jesus Christ is at the door. So what is the parable of the fig tree? Throughout the scripture, time and time again, and I don't have verses in the in your notes to document it, but if we go back and would actually dig, dig deeper, one of the symbols of Israel is that of the fig tree. When her branches are yet tender. Well, what are, when are branches tender? An oak tree doesn't grow up and immediately you have these massive branches coming out. They start off small and they get large. <coughs> so when they're small, they're tender. When it's younger. There is a huge, huge event that happened that we need to document with Israel. Because when we're looking at uh, Matthew 24 and 25... It's not really written to the church. It's written to the Jews. There are things contained within this passage, and we'll hopefully talk about that here in a little bit, why it's Jewish in, Jewish in nature. It's all geared towards the Jews. It really is, because that's who Jesus is talking to. He's talking to Jewish people. So when we're talking about Israel, there's one big event that happened that literally, basically broke them off from being a superpower during their lifetime. And that was the Babylonian captivity. When Nebuchadnezzar came in and ransacked Babylon, and oh, we know that Egypt helped with Pharaoh and other ones, but the Babylonian captivity, that is what God said, you know what, I had enough of it. At this point, I am going to cut you off, I am going to break you up, it's not that I'm going, not going to bring you back and completely utterly destroy you, but you know what? You're going to wallow in sin. You're going to be divided amongst the Gentiles for a very, very, very long time. It wasn't until May 14th. Like I said, I'm all over my nose. You're going to have to forgive me. May of 1948. May 14, 1948. That is the first time since Nebuchadnezzar ransacked Jerusalem and took it under that Israel actually became, became a nation. We know that Titus helped destroy it in 70 AD, but Israel hasn't been, wasn't a nation for hundreds and hundreds of years. And then all of a sudden, in 1948, we have something completely out of the ordinary. We have England trying to figure out what she's going to do after she has this big old upheaval with her colony in India. What are we going to do about Israel? Well, let's just make her own country and be done with it. She's no longer going to be one of our colonies. Let's make Israel her own country. And in 1948, the fig tree comes into existence. Now, while her branches are yet tender, beware, because the coming of Jesus Christ is at the door. Really, Israel's not been a nation that long. I mean, really, if we talk about America, America's not been a nation that long. We've been around for, what, 200 years? 
going on 300 years, hopefully. And Israel just became a nation in 1948. It hasn't even been 100 years. However, if we go back to reading the scriptures, there is a passage where... Do, 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 do. This generation shall not pass. I did not mark the verse in my notes. But this generation shall not pass. What is a generation? There have been all kinds of speculations on what a generation was or is. Because some will claim that it's the gap between generation to generation, about 15 years. Others have argued that it's about 30 years. But if we go with the lifetime or the lifespan of a human being, it could be 100 years, it could be 90 years. And really, when it comes to Israel being a nation, has it even been 100 years yet? No. So her branches are still yet tender. But if we know one thing, it's this. This generation shall not pass. The coming of Jesus Christ is coming quicker than we could ever dream or imagine. So when we look at Matthew 24, 25 as the Olivet Discourse, this is an extremely important passage for all kinds of reasons. But it gives us insight to what the coming of Jesus Christ shall be and what the signs of the times shall be like before that. And I need to move on quickly because I am practically out of time. But why is this passage Jewish in nature? First of all, if we would look in verse 15 of Matthew, Matthew chapter 24, we deal with something that's extremely important. What is mentioned in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14? If it's easier, just go ahead and read it. So verse 14 or 15? 15, I'm sorry, 15. Daniel's prophecy. Daniel's prophecy. And what was the prophecy concerning? It's concerning one big event. Ah, the abomination and desolation. We find that occurring in Revelation chapter 12, and it's in your notes, because I am all over the place at this point. But the abomination and desolation. We as a church, for the most part, believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. That the rapture is going to happen in Revelation chapter 4. That when the door was opened up in, in uh, Revelation, and John was caught up, that's when the rapture is going to happen because really there is no other location in the book of Revelation to even mention the rapture. So first of all, most of us don't believe we're going to be around for it. If we are, then we're just going to keep looking up and knowing that we didn't miss anything because Jesus Christ is still coming back at any moment. I'm not going to lose my salvation if I'm wrong with that he didn't come back at the very beginning. But we know that this is important for the Jews to begin with because for us... Hindsight's 2020, and we've already had an example of the abomination of desolation take place to some degree way back with Antiochus Epiphanes, because he came in, oh, he was a Roman, came into the temple, and he offered a pig up on the altar to Zeus. He defiled the temple. That was an abomination. We know that the Antichrist is going to take over, get up, and proclaim himself in, as God in Revelation chapter 12 with the uh, abomination of desolation. What exactly is the abomination of desolation? No one really knows. With our knowledge of technology, there are some that believe it will be in uh, robot artificial intelligence because the, the false prophet is actually going to make the image speak. It could also be, I believe, the fact that the uh, Antichrist himself, it is very possible, very possible, because at this point, they don't have the Ark of the Covenant. So what if they set up a throne in the Holy of Holies to God? That wouldn't be out of the ordinary. It might seem a little odd, but if we go back to the synagogue during Jesus' time, and it's in your notes, there was a seat that was kept empty called the Messiah seat. Now, you're not going to see that listed in Scripture, but if you study out the passage where Jesus got up, he read the scroll of the book of Isaiah concerning himself, 
and he sat down. What caused all the ruckus about him sitting down was he sat down in the Messiah's seat. He declared that he was the Son of God. That was the outrage. So what if they never find the Ark of the Covenant, there's a throne in the Holy of Holies as the throne of God, and the Antichrist sits down there declaring himself God. These are all, of course, speculation because hindsight's 2020. We don't know what the future holds. And honestly, I don't plan on being around, and I don't want to be around for it. I really don't. I think I have more time than I thought. I do. Okay, good. I will slow down a little bit. I'm sorry. I, I, saw, the, I saw the hour hand, and I thought it was the minute hand. So we know why it's Jewish in nature. The second thing is, in verse, and I don't have it down. Someone please read, well, I'll go ahead and read it because I didn't put the chapter. I think it's 24. Is it 16 through 20? Yep, Matthew chapter 24, verses 16 through 20. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. And this is the passage that mentions the Sabbath day journey, so watch out for it. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house, neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. Verse 20. But pray ye that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Jesus gives warning that when they see these things start coming to pass, flee to the mountains. And let me just back up. And he actually mentions what we were just speaking of, the abomination of desolation, as mentioned in verse 15. In verse 15, we have the abomination of desolation. And Jesus Christ tells his disciples, when you see these things, you know what? Don't even get your things together. But flee to the mountains. We actually have historical reference to this. Because... When Titus ransacked Jerusalem and tore down the temple in 70 AD, there was a group of Jews that actually remembered this passage, and they took off. And you know where they fled to? They fled to Petra. Petra is known as the Red Rose City. I should have went into more detail with my notes, but I was running out of um, sections of uh, space with my notes in general. But Petra is the Red Rose City. And I know what you're saying in your mind, brother. What in the world is that? We have to get a little carnal to really realize what it is, but we've all seen at least some of the images of Petra. Because the treasury of Petra is what they use for the shooting of Indiana Jones. So if you've ever seen uh, the Red Rose City, the Indiana Jones, don't admit to it, but the shot there that they use, the most famous one, is of the treasury. And that is the most famous shot that you will see of any picture is the shot of the entrance into the treasury of Petra. The crescent moon, that was the canyon going into Petra. That is, Petra is a fortified city in the mountains with one entrance. And it is a tough entrance. And you can't get a large army through it. The whole reason we go down to the Audubon, the reason Hitler created the Audubon in the first place was so he had a wide, vast road where he could move a lot of military down and a lot of military equipment as fast as possible. Well, when you have a little narrow path, you can't get a large army down. Plus, they can attack from up above. So when you're in that crescent, I can't remember how many men across you can get through there, but it's not many. And if you're up on top and everybody's stuck in that canyon, it doesn't take much to push rocks, boulders, and with today's technology, just annihilate them. They are stuck. So Petra is literally a fortress. So where will the Jews flee during the tribulation period when they see the abomination of desolation? Those that are looking are knowledgeable of the scriptures. More than likely, they will go back to that red, red rose city, the city of Petra. Okay. We are living in a time... As Matthew chapter 24 and verse 6 states, and the Bible reads, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of war. See that ye be not troubled, 
For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So, the war, um, wars and rumors of wars. This is not the end, but it's a sign that we are getting there. Is that uncommon today? For there to be wars or rumors of war? I mean, realistically, sitting here tonight, to even mention that, it probably just doesn't faze us at all. Because how many times have we heard about this war, or this happening, that happening? And we are living in a day and age where war isn't necessarily necessarily England versus France, United States versus Canada, whatever you want it to be. But war is broken down onto groups and factions, so much so that we have an enemy that doesn't have a country at all. We have they have no prime location, that central location that they're out of, that we're aware of, they move about. They plant their people in what they call sleeper cells, just waiting for the moment to receive their instructions to go ahead and tax them. What am I referring to? I'm talking about Islam. There is no doubt today that Islam is at war with the world, and the world should be at war with Islam. People will say, well, it's a peaceful, it's really a peaceful religion, only those high diehards. Well, really, that's not true. If you go back to the words of Muhammad, he told them to spread the religion by the sword of captive. You know, kill people. So really these radical extremists is what they call them, really are radical in their religion, but they're following the teaching of Muhammad the way that he expected it to be. And we are now fighting a war that is no longer just country to country, but is religion versus a country. Or religion about against this person. And really when you get down to Islam, they refer to um, Israel as little Satan and the America as big say because we back up Israel. We'll support her. It's not that because we're a nation, but it's because we're supporting Israel. That's their big thing. When it comes to the Middle East, we just roll our eyes when it comes to war. We really do. Because when was the last time there was peace in the Middle East to begin with? They're constantly trying to get peace talks in. Surrender this and surrender this. And, Israel, and it's always Israel has to give up this. And Israel has to give up that. But regardless, there's constantly mayhem over there. There's constantly war. Whether it's Syria, whether it's Iraq, whether it's Iran. There's always some country coming against Israel. Whether, and it doesn't matter. And her enemy surrounds her on all sides. And the real question is, isn't that... Is it when is there going to be peace in the Middle East? Because we know that there's going to be constantly wars and rumors of wars. <clears throat> when it comes to anti-events, what side is Egypt going to be on? Because she has a peace treaty with Israel right now. Is she going to join in the final attack in Israel on the end days? Or is she going to maintain her peace treaty? But we know that one of the signs that Jesus Christ comes back is going to be wars and rumors of wars. If we go down to verse 7. For a nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. But we're going to go ahead and read verse 8 to tie this all in. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. So this isn't the sign of Jesus Christ coming back. This is just the beginning of everything getting into place. God is getting the ball rolling. And... We're seeing these things more and more. Especially earthquakes is probably the ones that we notice more and more. Just back in 2011, we had an earthquake that I would think be in a weird location. And that was in central Virginia. And where was that earthquake felt? We literally felt the aftermath of the earthquake here in central Pennsylvania, exactly where we're at. We felt the tremors. When was the last time that we actually felt a tremor or something like that before from an earthquake? Earthquake in diverse places. And we can go on and on and on. I'm sure there's other places we could talk about with earthquake that normally it wouldn't be. But this one just hits home for us because this is where we live. We had an earthquake in 2011 that literally shook the ground where we're at. It may not have been to the point that anything collapsed, but it was enough that we felt it and things maybe moved a little bit. That is odd for where we're at. Really, I've discussed everything in my notes, and really, there are 97 verses 
in this chapter. We could go on and on and on. It's not a chapter that we're not in common with. Really, if we get in verse chapter 25, we get those three big parables that we've all heard and probably time and time again. Even preached on the parable of the faithful and evil servant, the parable of the ten virgins, the parable of the talents. The talent, one had one, one had three, one had five, one buried it in the earth. You know, these are all things that we're familiar with, but I just want to look back at it because sometimes we don't always grasp the significance of what's happening. You know, Matthew 24 and 25 together are one cohesive unit. They are the Olivet Discourse. This is probably one of the last major talks that Jesus had with his disciples. That almost, if you want to say, even the last question and answer session. You know, what are your questions? What do you want to talk about? And they said, tell us what's going to be when it comes to the end of the world. What are the signs of your coming? What should we be watching for? When shall they take place? And all these questions are the same questions that even today, you and I in the church world would have for Jesus if we were to sit down. You know, Christ, when are you going to come back? If this was not documented in Scripture or anywhere else of the signs of his coming... You know, when are we coming? When are you coming back? You know, they say we're fools. They say that because we say that you're going to come back again. It's been over 2,000 years and you're still not here. Give us something to hang on to. How do we know without a shadow of doubt what you say is real? And that give us something, some faith, that, some science that we can grasp and literally wrap our teeth around. What is something we can cling to? We saw how this is Jewish in nature because really that's what Jesus was talking to. The church had not yet come into existence. He was talking to a bunch of Jews. So he was telling them for their time, for their culture, for their country. And we could go, and then we talked about the importance of Mount Olivet itself. This is probably the last place he gave his last major discourse and talked to with the Jews. It's the place where he came from with the donkey and the colt that he rode in Jerusalem. It's the place where he solidified everything when it came to the cross. It's the last place his feet left on this earth, and it's going to be the very first place where his feet sat down on this earth. Does anybody have any thoughts, any questions, anything that they want to add to it? If nothing else, I hope that it provided some insight that we were able to glean something, maybe connect some pieces. Because the more we study the Word of God, the more things just come alive as you see this and this and this and this and this and this. And, this. and they just match. The Word of God just goes hand in hand all together. Everybody's heart's clear. No thoughts. Any questions? If not, let us all stand. And Brother Peterman, would you like to dismiss us in prayer tonight? So thankful once again to be here tonight, Lord, to be in your presence, to, to hear this word tonight, Lord. Lord, we ask that it just falls on the floor of the ground, Lord, just rose in our